Right, well, thanks, Rob. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, as Rob said, I've been tasked with the job of telling you something about Nuffield, or if you like, the how, what and why of Nuffield. And um, I guess um, the start of the whole story starts 137 years ago with the birth of this man. Uh, William Richard Morris was born on the 10th of October 1877 to a working class family in Worcester in the UK. He grew up in the outskirts of uh, Oxford. Um, he went to school to the age of 15. He was then apprenticed to a bicycle maker. Nine months later, he asked for a pay rise and was refused, so he decided to set up his own bicycle repair centre. He uh, went on to start making bicycles. A few years later, he put engines on bicycles and by the turn of the century, you might remember, um, the motor car industry around Europe and the world was starting to make headway. And it wasn't long before Morris uh, set up his own garage to repair motor cars. That wasn't enough. So in 1913, he produced his first car, the uh, Morris Oxford. Um, <coughs> 18 months later, at the outbreak of the First World War, he was producing 100 cars, um, Morris Oxford cars a month. But of course, not for the first time, nor the last, uh, Morris had to reinvent himself at the start of the war because uh, motor car sales collapsed. Um, uh, his business, which was a fledgling business at that stage, obviously had to look in other directions. So he won a number of contracts from the Ministry of Defence in the UK, but significantly at that time, he also was in high demand for a number of government committees to uh, how, looking at how they could um, streamline war, war production efforts. So Morris saw through the uh, First World War and he came, certainly came out of the First World War with his reputation greatly enhanced. And to, he'd obviously developed, um, uh, demonstrated his skills as, a, um, uh, as an organiser and uh, in influencing production methods. It was between the, world, the wars that uh, he became really established in the motor car industry and uh, in fact he went on to produce in that period he hit the morris cars as they were called then he had about approximately 51 percent of the uk market of cars so he was a very significant player he became a household name during that period and of course at the same time he made a great fortune but uh, the Second World War was really a bit of a turning point in his life. His uh, health became, started to uh, decline. Um, his influence, although still great, uh, was also in decline. And uh, although his motor car enterprise went on to even greater things, post-war, of course, saw many changes in the car industry in Britain and around the world, amalgamations, etc., which he was also involved with. But eventually, um, uh, and after his death in 1963, of course, the Morris brand disappeared altogether. It was swept up in the British Leyland, uh, um, as British Leyland took over much of the, the UK motor industry. But I guess, um, oh, and the other thing, uh, which of course uh, was very important in his life, in 1934, he was made a peer of the realm and took the name of Lord Nuffield and hence, of course, the name that is bequeathed to us. But it's often the case in uh, people's life that it's not what they do in life for which they are remembered, but uh, what the legacy they leave behind. Uh, Winston Churchill put it another way. He said that we make a living by what we get that we make a life by what we give. And so it was with Nuffield. And to give some idea of his philanthropy, 
Between 1923 and 1946, he gave away some £24 million um, to causes such as forces of the Crown, to cripples and, and a range of local hospitals, many of the sort of areas that today we would uh, expect governments to have responsibility for. In 19, uh, 1934, he also uh, set up and gave 10 million Morris shares, 10 million pounds worth of Morris shares to the Nuffield Foundation, an organisation that continues to this day um, in the UK, which uh, has, does a lot of funding of uh, medical research and a whole range of other causes. But uh, to put that in some context, although it doesn't sound much by today's standards, of course, if you roll the numbers forward, you're looking at um, philanthropy worth in the order of multi-billions of dollars in today's terms. So he was a very significant contributor to a number of, and a range of causes. So, um, after the Second World War, um, it, Nuffield was approached, and the foundation was approached, to provide scholarships for farmers. Now, if we go back to that time post-war, uh, you might remember that uh, Britain was still had uh, food rationing. In fact, food rationing in, uh, uh, in Britain continued right through to 1954, uh, when it was eventually lifted on and meat and ba bacon. So you can see that uh, it was well imprinted on the English mind and much of Europe, of course, is the deprivations of food um, rationing during those times. So it was thought that farmers should be thanked for the contribution that they had made to feeding the country. So uh, the, uh, the objective was to provide a scholarship for farmers to travel around various parts of the world to study agriculture and for further the cause of uh, better agricultural methods. So uh, the foundation, the Nuffield Foundation in 1947 funded uh, a series of, uh, uh, agreed to fund some uh, travelling scholarship for farmers and hence uh, the Nuffield Scholarship Scheme was born. In 1947 three scholars were selected in, in Britain, two men and a woman. Um, one year later, um, Zimbabwe joined the scheme. Uh, in 1950, Australia, New Zealand and Canada joined the scheme. Um, and then in later years, we had uh, Kenya, who, who no longer, oh, were only part of it for a couple of years for obvious reasons. Zimbabwe latterly has dropped out for obvious reasons as well. But we've also had um, uh, Ireland join the scheme, France join the scheme, and uh, in the last few years, the Netherlands joined the scheme. But uh, in 1950, the first Australians were selected, and we had two scholars selected, uh, Neil McNeil from Western Australia and Bert Kelly from South Australia. And both of those men went on to uh, enter federal parliament, and Bert, of course, is well known for his advocacy of free trade and uh, pointing out the disadvantages to Australia of the protectionism that was introduced uh, not long after Federation in 1901. But we're delighted to also today have Bert's uh, son um, here, Kim Kelly. So, good to see you, Kim. So the, the history of Nuffield Australia from there was that uh, for many years we only selected two, maybe three scholars a year for, from around Australia. And uh, under the funding received from um, the Nuffield Foundation, that continued through to 1916, this is not, sorry, 1967 where, or 68 when uh, the funding was, uh, the Nuffield Foundation ceased funding the Nuffield schemes around the world. So each country was charged with the responsibility of funding their own scholars. And uh, thanks to the initiatives of George Wilson, who was uh, chairman of Nuffield in those days, the scheme was advanced in Australia and successfully. But still, only two to three scholars were selected a year. 
right up until uh, the 1990s, and in fact, in, up until the scheme started to expand in 1997, um, under the leadership of Harry Perkins. Harry was then chairman of Nuffield. He was also chairman of uh, West Farmers and uh, saw West Farmers through uh, an important stage in its growth. In fact, he was uh, chairman of West Farmers through to his death in about, uh, from memory, about 1996 or seven. So, sorry, no, 2006 or seven. So, so Harry did two things. He started to expand the number of scholarships, but he also instigated an external review, and this was carried out by Neil Enall and Jeff Miller, who were also uh, famous in uh, um, agriculture in Australia. And uh, not surprisingly, the Enall and uh, uh, Miller review uh, rather um, uh, um, confirmed Harry's view of where, uh, where Nuffield should go. In essence, what it suggested that the scheme um, was extremely successful, but the number of scholars being selected was not having a great impact on, on Australia. In fact, we had reached a critical number of scholars. In other words, they were falling off one end as quick as they were putting on, put on at the other. So, um, so uh, the expansion it started started in uh, in the late um, in the late uh, 90s, and we're delighted um, uh, over this weekend to announce uh, 26 new scholars in Australia. So the program has expanded significantly, and of course a lot of money is raised to, uh, raised annually to provide those scholarships for all those people, but. I, I guess there's the other significant thing for Nuffield Australia during this period and of expansion was what it also achieved for Nuffield internationally. And there's probably three events, not necessarily in the correct order of when they were implemented, but uh, it, I want to create a little picture of what also what our scholars do these days. The first significant event was uh, that I'd like to talk about is the establishment of what we call the Contemporary Scholars Conference, or the CSC. Uh, the, CS, the first CSC w was held nine years ago in Utrecht in, uh, in the Netherlands under the auspices of Rabobank. Um, and the aim of it was to bring together all the scholars worldwide that were going to study in that year. Now, up until that time, the scholarships were awarded, but rarely, or very rarely, did any, any of them, particularly um, in, uh, from different nations, get together as a whole. The idea was not only to get all these new scholars together for one week in one place somewhere in the world, but was to uh, give them time to develop uh, new contacts and, uh, and leads, but also to give them an overview of world agriculture, to give them an understanding of what are the forces that are, are, are shaping world agriculture and where they might fit into that. So this is a broad overview of world agriculture. So the CSC is the first event on the annual calendar of, of anyone doing an Nuffield scholarship. The, the, the second initiative that uh, Australia was part of, uh, sorry, uh, drove and still manages, is uh, what we call the Global Focus Program. Now, the uh, Global Focus Program is, is a scheme whereby all new scholars from a number of the countries, but not all countries, but certainly for <coughs> Australia and, and two or three other countries, it's a uh, compulsory part of the scholars' um, uh, scholar, scholarship. The idea of the Global Focus Program is to put together a group of uh, five, six, seven, up to ten uh, scholars from maybe uh, two or three different countries and give them a whirlwind six weeks tour of the world. And typically that will include uh, one developing country, uh, Brazil, uh, China, uh, India or Africa. It will include uh, uh, decision-making centres of the world, um, Washington DC, Brussels, London, 
and it would also put them in paddy fields and it would put them in the most advanced farming operations in the world. The idea is again to broaden their mind, to see that there's a world of agriculture outside their particular uh, little area of expertise and influence. So uh, that is a somewhat hectic six weeks journey. They, uh, they spend a lot of time on planes and travel, etc. But I don't think you could ask any scholar that has been through a GFP and they'll tell you that it's one of the most life-changing events that they do. Finally, the scholars have to go, go out and, um, and do their own study tour and then finally come back to the alumni, as we're going to see later on today, and do a report for, on their scholarship. But there's one other event that, uh, that Nuffield Australia also, sorry, there's one other um, thing that Nuffield Australia has taken a leadership role in, it, and that is the creation of an international body. In other words, there are seven participating, currently seven participating countries in Nuffield. Um, and up until three years ago, there was a loose arrangement whereby they came together, but there was no body as such. In 2011, all the countries involved with Nuffield came together and signed an agreement which would give us the ability to make a common decision-making, or we'd have a common decision-making process for uh, Nuffield worldwide. It would allow decisions that needed to be taken at an international level to be taken. And also it allowed for a, a process for new countries, for new scholarships to be introduced into the scheme. And one of the key purposes of this was to look ahead and see what agriculture into the future might need. Now, any organisation that is going to advance and go forward must have some view of the future. And whilst some of the views I might say are, are my own and not necessarily totally agree, I don't think there's any doubt that the world is entering a very interesting and challenging period, not the least for agriculture. It depends who you listen to, but uh, we may need to, if um, the population of the world reaches the 9 to 9.5 billion people that is expected by the year 2050, if the increase in food demand is to go on, uh, the various estimates are that we might need to produce up to double the amount of food in the next 40 years than we're doing now. Um, equally, um, or put in another way, uh, as much food has been produced in the history of mankind. There is another final challenge that I think we face, and that although agriculture has been practised for the last few thousand years, Modern ag agriculture is only 50 odd years old. Most of the big advances in agriculture are only 15 to 20 years old. The sustainability of many of the systems of agriculture we have is probably questionable. So my parting thought is that agriculture has some great challenges ahead. I don't think there's any body, any group of farmers that have got a better network than Nuffield has worldwide. I think Nuffield can play a significant event, a significant role in the future of agriculture, not only within Australia but worldwide. Um, I think this man, who would be pleased with what we've done so far, would be expecting us to step up to the plate for the years ahead. Thank you.